Okay, so this is um, uh, episode two of interviewing Jamie Barker. Um, so if you listen to episode one, basically up until this point, we've talked to Jamie about his career in law enforcement, and we've gone all the way up through um, patrol. And at this point, um, Jamie's going to start talking about um, becoming a detective. And in here, uh, he's a property crimes detective, and then he eventually he gets to uh, major crimes and homicide. So take it away. All right. Um, so um, as, a, as a young father of, of now four children, and a wife who is in all four of these kids were were, were born like uh, two years apart. So th it's an active group, um, and and the wife is is uh, you know keeping it together as best she can. Ginger, she's a good kid. I've said that, and she, that she is. Um, but uh, she uh, was was tired of me working uh, graveyard patrol. And I did that for 18 months, and then I told her, okay, um, when she told me um, I'm about to get an apartment and you're going to take the kids, um, I said, okay, I'll switch over to day shift, and then I did. I switched over to days. That gave us a little bit of a, of a reprieve as far as child care and, and all of that stuff, and they could actually see Dad. Um, and then the, there was a, a posting for property crimes detectives uh, that opened up, and I, I went ahead and applied for that. And uh, I didn't think I'd get it. Um, here I am, kind of fairly new-ish. Uh, but I did. I, I got that spot. And I worked for uh, Sergeant Larry Robertson, a great, great supervisor, really good sergeant. Um, he taught me a lot about what detectives do and some of the expectations uh, that, that, are, that are required uh, from a detective. Um, basically, um, yes, you're part of a team of detectives, but you kind of have to be your own self-starter. You're kind of you're responsible for um, a caseload, and you have to manage your caseload, and um, you have follow-ups to do, and you have all of this um, uh, all of this other ancillary work that comes along with uh, with that. Plus, you have interview schools that you go to and you learn how to you know grill people a little bit um, and and talk talk a little bit more in depth in a in a controlled in interview interrogation style and so all of that was really great and I, I drank all that up and it was it was wonderful and um, the cases were not all that difficult um, and I and I did have the opportunity to have a partner um, in in that assignment, and so that was great. I'd never really had a, 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 somebody that I worked with every day on stuff, and he had his own caseload. I had mine, but we kind of combined a lot of our stuff. His name is Corby, uh, a, a fantastic interviewer, um, and uh, um, we found that you know doing property crimes, there's not anything in that caseload that was emergent. Right, um, very rarely. So somebody got their their property stolen out of their car, or somebody broke into a business and they got their stuff ripped off. Whatever. Um, it was mostly property crimes, um, and and so none of that is really life and death, right? So we we got search warrants, you know, and we would search storage units and all kinds of stuff as we as we would do our work. One day, um, and we kind of. We kind of, uh, Monday was the day where uh, we we followed the weekend where there's no detectives uh, working during the weekend. So Friday at 4, detectives go home. And so Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night, there isn't any detectives other than the one detective that's on call. And unless you get a call out or something, your, your, your weekend is your own. You get to do whatever. Well, um, sometimes things happen that need to have follow-up, and uh, there was one particular thing uh, that was a missing person uh, report that uh, was taken by one of our reserve deputies, um, and he was he was decent. He wrote a he wrote a good report, but you know when you write a missing persons report, 
you, you have to have specific data so that it can be entered into NCIC. Um, and he didn't have that data yet. So the report um, that was taken on Friday night was in the suspense file. Now this deputy had given his cell phone, his personal cell phone number, to um, the reporting party to say, look, if you get this information, please let me know. We can keep on rolling with this. Right now it's kind of held um, and we need to uh, you know, proceed with this. So please call me, we'll get it done. Well, it, that call never happened. And, um, and this was a call from, I think it was his brother, uh, the missing person's brother. It was a guy that was missing. He lived out in Cuna with his wife. The wife didn't call, his brother called. Okay, um, so uh, Monday morning rolls around and my Sergeant Larry, he walks in and Larry uh, is, he's prone to, uh, as most supervisors are, uh, some stress on occasion when lieutenants or captains, or in this case, the sheriff um, has, has bent his ear about what are we doing about this case right now. So, and that was something that occurred frequently on a Monday, right? Well, Corby and I uh, started calling Monday Save the World Day because the, the guys that were assigned um, specifically to the, the larger crimes, the, the murders, the, the rapes, the ag assaults, the kidnappings, um, they were busy doing other things. Whereas a case like a missing person needed some follow-up, but a, pro a property crimes dude could do it. It's basically go do a knock and talk at the house, which it fell to Corby and I to go travel out to CUNA and do a knock and talk and see if we could talk to the wife of this missing person. And that's what we did. Um, and in pr preparation for that, we were kind of brainstorming. Now, he lived out in CUNA, um, which is deep South County, um, on, the, on the edge of the desert. And you know, we had seen a number of cases where people give up on life and you know, maybe they just, you know, Goodbye, cruel world. They walk out into the desert. They eat their gun, and somebody someday will find them. This happens. We'd been to a, a few of these kinds of scenarios, right? And so we're thinking maybe that happened. Although the wife's not very frantic about it. Um, she's, you know, she'd been contacted by uh, this guy's work. Work had called. Where is he? He had just been promoted. Where, where is, uh, where is uh, this guy? Um, and, and all she had to say was, I don't know, he's gone. I don't know, he's gone. That's what she said. All right. Well, we were going to try and see if we could get a little bit more than, well, I don't know, he's gone, out of her when we go knock on the door. So, so we travel out there. We, we see her. She's in the front yard, and, and um, she's, she's playing with a dog. And uh, we... We you know, just kind of walk up, introduce ourselves. And in that day, uh, I was working for Sheriff Von Colleen at that time. And sheriff's uh, detectives had to uh, wear a suit and tie um, if you're a detective. Once we started working for uh, uh, Sheriff Rainey, um, yeah, golf shirts and, you know, polos. It became a little easier from a wardrobe uh, perspective. But we're in our suits. It's a, it's a warm-ish day. Uh, we go out there and we introduce ourselves and we say why we're there. Is there a way that we could visit with you perhaps inside? And she says, sure, come on in. So we go in. We go into the house. We sit down at her kitchen table and we start visiting with her about things. And, and uh, how is everything? And, you know, we're just kind of curious about where uh, Dennis might have gone. We don't, we don't know. And she's like, gee, you know, he's just gone. He... Uh, well, and, uh, did he take his vehicle? No, it's in the in the driveway. Um, well, okay, so we're going, and we we talk. It's a soft interview, um, and uh, we're not hit, we're not hitting any hard things at all in in our visit with her initially. Um, she asked at one point, "Can can I go out and uh, talk to the dog uh, for a minute?" And absolutely, would you mind, is it okay if we just kind of sit here? Yeah, no problem. So she goes out and she talks to the dog for a little bit. 
All right. And so Corby and I were talking. We're like, mm, you know, I'm, I don't know what, what's, uh, what's going on here. And, and she's not giving us anything. And we've come to that conclusion. So uh, we're going to ask if we can take a look around. That's what we're going to do. Okay. Well, before we do that, we should probably get her to sign a little consent search form. Good idea. Let me go get one. I go out to the car, grab the form, come back. She comes back in, and, and uh, we sort of engage in our conversation a little bit, and then we kind of introduce the idea of we'd like to kind of maybe take a look around, but before we do that, we need to have you kind of read through this piece of paper, maybe fill it out, and sign it on the bottom. And, and she does. She fills the whole thing out. And she's asking, okay, and you're a detective who? And she writes that down. And you're a detective who? Okay, and writes that down. She fills out the whole thing. And she signs it. She understands what it is, and she's uh, okay. Well, we're just gonna we're just gonna take a peek. Well, um, I start, and it's it's basically it's a it's a two bedroom ranch style house. It's not huge, um, and uh, it's got you know it's on a on a decent piece of ground, whatnot. But we start looking around, and uh, I don't know uh, for for guys. There's, there's a place when we come home at the end of a day uh, and we're going to change our clothes or whatever, we take things out of our pockets and we put them usually in one spot, right? Um, and there's that one spot. I found that one spot. It's in a TV room. It was a bedroom. It was turned into a TV room. And it had some of his clothing, you know, in the, in the closet and whatnot. And uh, uh, in, in this uh, spot... It, well, there was his wallet, and there were his keys, and there was his watch, and there was his work ID, and there's his daggum glasses that he wears on his face. I'm like, okay, that's really odd. Um, and it made me think, well, he didn't go far. He's got all his stuff right here. I'm thinking this to myself. Now we, in, in preparation for this contact, we called, Corby and I, called um, a Boise police officer who has a dog. Because we were thinking uh, that we would, you know, maybe we would do this little search here and then um, uh, this canine officer would help us with his, he had a bloodhound named Belle. She was a beautiful bloodhound. Um, and uh, maybe we could cut a trail out to the desert and find what we thought maybe would be the end of the head thing. Um, and so um, I ask uh, the canine officer, um, you know, since he's not in a suit, he's wearing jeans and kind of not, you know, not dirty clothes or, or clean clothes. Um, uh, could you, could you help us with kind of looking in the dirtier spots in the house? Sure. No problem. So the first thing in this in this TV room, there's a floor hatch into the bottom of the house, and so he's he's going around, he's looking and stuff, and finally he comes into that room and pops that floor hatch off there, and there's an an odor that comes up out of that hatch. And I'm like, oh, well, that's troubling, and um, and he thought it was a little troubling. He went down there and he had his light and he's. And he's looking, and he, he pops his head back up, and he says, Hey, Barker, there's a, there's a shape down here that I can't readily identify. It's dark, and it's got uh, clear plastic over it, and there's like some, looks like condensation on the interior of that clear plastic. And I said, well, um, okay, that's, that's strange. Um, is there any way that you could maybe give it a little, just on the outside, maybe give a little feel to see if you can maybe identify what that might be. And he says, sure, I'll try that. He scurries over there and does it, and he comes back up, and he's like, I felt a foot. And, and I said, okay, let's get up out of the hole. We're, we're done. Um, and so he comes up out of the hole, and uh, now Corby has been in the living room, he'd done his searching about, um, didn't really come up with anything, and uh, he'd been, he, he was kind of sitting on the arm of the couch, uh, Lord, uh, and, and this, this gal is, uh, is sitting on, on the couch, and he's kind of closed distance, and like I said, Corby's a good interviewer, really good, and 
um, he can tell that this gal has something that she wants to say, but she's not saying it. And, uh, and so Corby's in kind of in that interview zone, and I could tell he's focused on trying to visit with her about things, and she's about maybe to say something. And um, so I kind of tug on his uh, jacket a little bit and kind of wave for him to come with me. And he just kind of looks over his shoulder and gives me a, you know, kind of furrowed brow look and turns back to uh, the gal that he's talking to and is continuing to talk. And I'm like, mm, I, I kind of tug on him a little more urgently and he kind of, now he's pissed. And, and so he says, excuse me, please. And he stands up and we walk down the hall to where we were just searching. And, and I, can, I can feel the laser darts that he's, that he's shooting into my back as we're walking down this hallway and we get into the room and I turn to, uh, to talk to him and he's, and he's about to, you know, just give it to me. And then he says, what is that god awful smell? <laughs> and I, I said, we found Dennis. <laughs> and he goes, oh, dear. And, and uh, he, it's at that point that we were really thankful that we had uh, had her fill out a consent to search form. Um, but uh, basically, um, everything stopped. Um, I did take, you know, back in the day, um, we had these cell phones. It was my very first cell phone. It was my personally owned, not a department phone, mind you. This was one of those gray uh, flip uh, Motorola phones with the antenna that you pull up. And I called Sergeant Larry and um, I, knew that, well, I knew what he was going to do. He was going to be rubbing his head and all kind of stuff. And so I, I called Sergeant Larry and I said, hey Larry. He called me Jaime. He says, hey Jaime, how's it going? And I said, we're Oh, we're doing real good. Uh, uh, we found him. And he goes, oh, good. Good. Where, uh, where'd you find him? I said, he's, he's under the house. And the, and the phone receiver, I can hear it as it hits the desktop. And he starts yelling for Ken Smith. Smith! <laughs> and Corby and I are just looking at each other, <laughs> kind of laughing a little bit. Anyway, um, Long story short, we spend probably the next 12 hours obtaining a search warrant for the house and um, uh, getting, uh, retrieving uh, the remains uh, out uh, from this crawl space. Um, and uh, this guy, ultimately, we, we spent a lot of time in court. Um, I was on the stand for like four hours, and I think Corby was on the stand for at least that long. Um, but telling this story, and we were referred to as robust detectives in our initial interview with her at the table, and, and how we must have, you know, we must have coerced her in some way, but that all fell on deaf ears, and, and, uh, and she was convicted of, uh, of a second-degree homicide, and, um, she's now out of prison, she's all fine, she's good, she's paid her debt to society and whatnot. So, um, but she, she got about, I think she was in for 22 years. Um, so clearly early on in my uh, career. But um, that was an interesting and kind of one of the, the first times that I ever uh, partook of a leading role in a homicide. Yes, I'm a property crimes detective. But as a team of folks, you know, we're, we're going to do these things as they, as they evolve, right? Um, and uh, um, so uh, I, I guess I would characterize a lead detective in a homicide as a combination of um, mother of the bride, caterer for the wedding, and um, the, uh, the, the wedding planner, um, all wrapped into one because you have to delegate so much. You can do this piece, but everything else is delegated, and the case file is often contained in boxes. You have so much stuff that ends up going to court. So I got a taste of, of being a lead uh, detective uh, there, um, and that was, that was an interesting eye-opener as a property crimes guy. <laughs> so Jamie, um, 
you know, up until this point, you know, obviously in the first part of our interview, I mean, it was interesting. You kind of talked about your progression and everything else, but you know, even when you were talking about patrol, you were talking about, oh, I'm kind of corralling horses, you right. know, there's not a whole bunch going on. And all of a sudden you're just getting jumped into basically the stuff at this point. Right. Yeah. So yeah, how did, how did you, uh, how did you feel about all that? Yeah, that was, it was definitely an education, you know, and um, I had been called out on things before, you know, because I had that CSI background. I had done, um, uh, done some, you know, work, you know, in, in some other bigger cases, but um, it, it definitely was a, you know what, I'm, I'm you know, in patrol, I could go home. On the jail, I could go home. I didn't have to think about work. When you have caseload, or when you're in the middle of something like this that I just described, um, you know, you're thinking about it all of the time. You're thinking about it all the time. And because it's, it's super important, number one, to somebody, and, uh, and it's, you have so much that you have to, to account for and do and document and make sure that everything is 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 straight and and uh but yeah that was that was an interesting um introduction into here's what being a detective really is um and there was i mean i could i could go uh on a camping trip sure but um in when i'm when i'm standing at the stream side you know with my fishing pole in i'm thinking about how am i going to interview this guy, what am I? What am I going to say to this guy? You know, and it's just in your head, and that's kind of, you know, it's kind of an interesting thing that just kind of takes over, kind of. So, uh, unless, unless you have, uh, you know, maybe some other stories you want to talk about property crime, how does, how do you get from property crime to homicide? So in my, in my case, um, property property crime is you know that's your assignment. You, and even though I had this homicide thing that I was working on, the property crimes keep coming in. And this we're talking about forty five cases new a month, and which is a lot. And you have to do something with them. And um, and my sergeant wasn't deferring because I had I had we all had our assignments. And so I was still um, working these these property crimes while I'm in in the middle of doing this other stuff. So it was that was all going on, but those those cases never stop. And sometimes, you know, um, there's the suspect information is really spotty on those things. And sometimes we just we don't know. Most of the time, we don't know who's doing it. And so we're trying to develop strategies as to how do we how do we catch you know the the burglar and, and sometimes it's kids you know jockey boxing in the middle of the night okay what are we going to do we're going to work at night we're going to you know do unmarked cars and we're going to stake out a uh, a neighborhood and we did that um, and and we caught people um, and we'd interview them and we'd clear a few cases and then you know do it some more but overall the clearance rate for those property crimes when we were working them, it was pretty low. It was a low percentage. And so it was kind of like beating your head against a wall um, in a lot of a lot of cases. Um, the stuff would get stolen and it would just be it would be gone. And so I didn't have a lot of really good news to tell victims. And you do that for four years. And at the end of and at the end of that period I was I was done. In fact one of the things that um, kind of piqued my interest was another stint in patrol because they had just changed the um, the shifts on patrol, which gave us a, an, an extra day off on patrol if you were working on patrol. So I thought, I'm going to do that. So I, I went back to patrol for two years. And I really liked that kind of break. Um, and uh, at, the, at the end of that two-year period, and I thought it was going to be longer, um, I was again working um, for Sergeant Larry Robertson, uh, but he was a, he was a uh, patrol sergeant, 
And um, I really loved working for him. And uh, he was getting transferred uh, back into detectives not in, and, and was going to be in uh, major crime. And I'm like, ooh, I don't, I'm looking at the horizon as far as, you know, who I could work for in patrol and doing this job continually in patrol. It's kind of the same thing. It's, you know, you're doing the same stuff. It's challenging and people make a career out of patrol and, and God bless them. Um, but, um, there was, I, I thought that there was a little more for me. And so I put in for this, uh, major crime spot. It was probably two months after Larry had made his way over as the detective sergeant. Um, and, um, and so I, I applied for that. And there was another candidate, um, that was also looking at this particular spot and they were looking at him really hard. And then Larry called me and said, we're looking at this other dude, uh, this other uh, deputy pretty hard for this, uh, this major crime spot. What have you got to offer? And I said, well, look, you know, and this is, this was a season of change at the sheriff's office when people were getting promoted, people were moving. Um, and one of the detectives that, uh, was a, was a primary arson investigator. Uh, had had promoted to sergeant, he was going to be working in the jail as a sergeant. Um, and so they were out an arson man. Well, I had arson investigation experience and um, had been to a number of schools. And so I was fairly qualified to do arson things. And so even though I don't like an arson case, they're stinky. I don't like them. Um, uh, I said, look, if, if you bring me on board, um, Obviously, you've got all my CSI talents, but I'll take the arson uh, caseload as well. And he that swung it, I think, because um, I got the spot. Um, the Lieutenant Pat Cowley offered my uh, offered me that spot in major crimes, and um, and so from from that, you know, then um, we're just kind of in the throw of of pretty much there's there's a number of of cases, some of these are cold cases um, that would that would come along. Um, there was a there was a, a really interesting cold case that came through um, that that we ended up working, um, and I worked closely with um, um, Ken Smith, who was our lead uh, homicide detective, um, and he was kind of teaching me stuff as we were going along, and he already knew that that, you know, he'd already worked with me on this other case. And so he kind of knew where I was and things. And so he continued uh, helping me. And we, we started with this, with this particular case. Um, we had a, a, a new hire in the jail uh, who had approached uh, Ken. One day, I think on a break somewhere, they were in the hall. And, and she said, hey, did you ever figure out anything about that homicide that occurred in 1982. And Ken's intrigued, he goes, wow, what case is that? And it was when the, the, the kid, the uh, uh, 16-year-old kid killed this old guy um, over in Meridian. And I said, well, Meridian, uh, and he says, well, I, I, no, I don't really know. And so he kind of, he kind of follows that up and, and they get a little bit more information. And, and kind of the story was, was um, this this sixteen year old kid and his mom were living in a trailer with an older guy, an elderly man um, whose name was Leo, and uh, Leo, uh, as an elderly man, a, a vet, um, had um, was always was going to the VA on a regular basis, getting meds. He took meds uh, all the time. Um, but he was, he was getting a social security check, a decent one. Um, uh, and, and, and this is kind of what this gal was, was kind of living on. They, he, they'd kind of hooked up and, and, and she didn't have a job. The 16 year old kid didn't have a job. This was, uh, you know, a, a revenue source, right? And, um, but apparently he taxed their patients at some point. And uh, 
uh, the, the gal tells the 16-year-old kid, take this baseball bat and go to work on him and kill him, which he did. And then they load him up. He's in his pajamas. He's in bed. And they, they load him up in their vehicle, kind of truss him up in all the bed clothes and stuff. And they go up towards McCall. And they find a spot off the road somewhere. And they dig a shallow grave and they plop him in there. And, uh, and then they come back. Well, this 16-year-old kid had a girlfriend. And this 16-year-old kid, being a 16-year-old kid, um, told his girlfriend, hey, I killed a dude. And she's like, oh, bull crap, right? And so he takes her into the trailer, uh, into the bedroom that he occupied. And, well, she says, there's blood everywhere. There's blood everywhere. And... Uh, Apparently, this kid gave a pretty graphic description of, of what had occurred. And so, she doesn't say nothing. They're kids. They just kind of go on with life. Mother cleans all the stuff up. We just keep going. Years go by. A couple of years. Like three or four years go by. And they're a little bit older now. They're still a couple. And there is, they get a little drunk and they have a little bit of a domestic violence thing between the two of them. And you know how that thing goes where, you know, you get to the family fight and you got the, the dude that's kind of being passive aggressive and she's all like, well, I'm going to tell him about how you killed somebody. And the deputy's like, oh, all right, you know, and they kind of, whatever. So that's kind of how this was. Although that statement was actually documented in a report on this DV that she indicated that he actually killed somebody. Of course, when he was asked about it, well, of course, I, never, I would never kill anybody. She's drunk, right? That's where that ended. Years go by. Ten. Twelve, I think. Years go by. And now, the girlfriend, she's living in Michigan. Uh, the mom, still collecting checks, by the way, is living in North Boise. The 16-year-old kid living up in Vancouver, Washington. And we kind of we kind of can kind of ascertains all this information. And, well, what do you do with it now? How would how do we proceed? And so we uh, we talked to some folks and it was decided we're gonna do a wiretap on the North and Boise home. And, of course, there's all kinds of things you have to do with a wiretap, right? Um, but, and we did all that stuff. And uh, tap, the, tap the phone line there. And then we got to have some stimulus um, to, to make somebody call someone. Like we were going to have the mama call the, the kid and talk about this subject on the phone, maybe, right? And so we fought, fly the gal in from from uh, Michigan, and I took her to this motel so that if they had caller ID on the phone, she could be calling from a motel, and we have her do what we call a slime call, basically a, a call into the, the residence. She talks to uh, the mother, and she discloses on the phone call, essentially, uh, look, um, I know what happened. You killed that old man. Um, I'm in Boise. Uh, I just want you to know I, I need some money. I need $5,000. Or I'm going to go to the cops with this story about how you killed this old man. Get me? And of course, on the other way, oh, honey, I don't know what you could be talking about. Oh, no. Oh, my goodness, no. And so finally, the call ends. And immediately she picks up the phone and calls a kid in Vancouver and says, did you ever take her into the bedroom? She talks about that. Did you ever take her to the grave site? I mean, it's a pretty good case at this point, right? So we, uh, we follow up on all that stuff. And we've got people. We've got Ken. Actually, Ken and his partner are up in Vancouver. As soon as that call is placed, 
they go and hook him up and, and bring him in for an interview. And he says lawyer, and uh, uh, me and, and uh, Sergeant Larry, we go over to the mama's house and we hook her up, bring her in, and she says lawyer. And so we, we move along and we develop the case. And uh, at the end of that, at the end of that, um, uh, we, and we have no body. No, no, we, she, the body's buried somewhere up near McCall. We don't know. They don't know. Um, and so, uh, at the end of that, they're convicted of, uh, of murder, and uh, the mother is in for life. And he who was 16, who was wielding the bat, got 45 ish years, something like that. And they're in prison still. Um, that was an interesting case because that had a lot of dynamic. Uh, things going on, um, and I got to participate in that uh, pretty good. Um, it was a, it was kind of a fun case to work. So, explain to the to the viewers, listeners. Um, you talk about major crimes. Yeah. And is for the Ada County Sheriff's Office is is major. What does major crimes work on, and is it? Does it cover homicide, or is there a separate homicide unit? So major crimes covers uh, the big five, right? Murder, rape, robbery, um, aggravated battery, and kidnapping. So those are the are the big cases that come in. Now, in addition to that, major crimes is always going to take the lead when necessary on uh, task force uh, operations, such as... Um, the Lynn Henneman Homicide Task Force that was a Boise PD case and it's, it was Boise PD had the lead on that. Dave Smith was the, the, the case lead on that and we contributed uh, investigators to that task force. Myself and another detective worked that for, uh, we put in like 80 some hours on that case. Um, the uh, Robert Manuel Homicide Task Force um, where this small child was was killed um, and dumped in the uh, New York Canal, um, ultimately recovered um, in the county. Um, that was a case that we did task force work on. Anytime a, uh, an, uh, there's an officer-involved shooting or a use of deadly force, um, they initiate the Critical Incident Task Force, the CITF. And we were instrumental in establishing that in Ada County. In fact, I wrote a lot of uh, policy and procedures for um, CSI stuff and first contact officer um, procedures for that critical incident task force. So anytime there was an officer involved, anything like that, uh, I was always involved as a CSI. I, was, I went to all of them. Um, and then... There was also the ICAC task force in, in conjunction with FBI uh, representatives and then area agency uh, operators would, would work to identify and apprehend um, individuals who were um, seeking to hook up with children. You know, it's kind of like that to catch a predator sort of thing. We would do that. We would set up a, uh, an apartment or a home or something like that that was vacant and we would have um, a we would have somebody that's chatting with uh, those individuals online and they would come to our place and we would summarily hook them up and take them to jail and do all the stuff that we needed to do for those guys and that was fun I like doing that um, let me, let me let me just quickly interrupt you. So, um, we don't have a lot of murders here in Boise per se, right? Compared right. to L.A. or right. wherever else. Yeah. But what we do have, after kind of chatting with you and going through some of your notes and stuff, are suicide stuff like that. A lot. Yeah. So, can you talk a little bit about that being in the major crimes unit and um, you know dealing with that? Sure. So, um, um, as, I, as I moved along in my career, um, I, I had an on-call role just like everybody else. And it was like we, we would be on a rotation. At some point, somebody said, let's take Barker out of that on-call rotation 
because whoever is on call, when they get called out, one of the first people they, they call is Barker because he's a CSI and oftentimes we need a CSI there. Um, and so um, I was kind of put on kind of permanent <laughs> call. Um, and uh, so, so whenever these, these cases would come, um, the, the suicides, uh, the, the accidental deaths, you know, be they drownings or whatever, I was involved in all of those. The, um, you know, if it's a traffic fatality, I was often in, in, in on those as well. Um, and anytime, basically anytime somebody died, there was a phone call placed that, that, that put me uh, in that scene. Um, and so, as a result, I saw lots and lots and lots of things, um, and I found that there are um, there are things that are common in each and every one of them, uh, or they're kind of common denominators in each of these scenes. And when when something was different, that always drew my attention. Uh, for example, um, we suicides by handgun were common. In fact, at one point, I think it was in uh, 2007, um, Ada County, Idaho, per capita was number four in the nation for suicides. We had a lot of suicides. Um, and they were mostly handgun suicides. Um, and when I would look at those, it was an auto pistol. Okay, we handle it the way we do. If it was a revolver, one of the things that I did was I always was very careful with the gun and, and looking at, you know, because mechanically it moves when you, when you press trigger. Um, if, the, if the cylinder is moved after the fact, you can tell that somebody's looked at the gun. I actually had that happen on a case. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's one of those things that really, you know, it's just one of those elements that kind of makes you, you know, focus in on, okay, what really happened here, that sort of thing. Um, but as, as an individual, um, I found that continuing to go to these things, um, you're, you kind of, you know, the first few were surreal. And I mean, we've been to, you know, lots of times as, as a younger person, sometimes we go to a funeral, uh, or something and we see, um, our relative or our friend you know, and they're in the casket, and they look different than when, what they look like in life. In, in a crime scene or an accident scene, in, in, you know, nothing's happened to them other than that trauma or whatever that made them a dead person, um, that's, that, that's different. They look much different. Um, and uh, initially it's shocking for, uh, for an investigator to see that, or for anyone to see uh, a dead person just like right there that just happened. Um, but, but over the course of time, uh, the more you go to these things, you do um, uh, become desensitized to um, a lot of that, right? So we're, we kind of almost take a, a clinical or analytical view of these and we're looking for cues like post-mortem body changes that will tell us how long they've been down. You know, the lividity, the rigor mortis, the body temperature, the, you know, how much, you know, was there a lot of bleeding? What, where's the trauma? That sort of thing. And so you, you kind of have that view and that kind of helps you, um, I guess, absorb that a little bit. Um, and you're not seeing, you're seeing the, the cues, you're not seeing the person. And, and thank God, really, um, I, I don't know all these people, right? That would, be, that would be rough if you knew them. And, you know, I didn't know any, hardly any of them. I knew a couple of them, um, and that was tough. I responded to a, uh, a scene where um, my, my very good friend, um, from high school um, was found by his wife and he had passed away and uh, that was that was a tough thing she was so distraught um, and apparently she didn't though the wife of my friend didn't get along with 
his mom. You know, that's a family dynamic that sometimes occurs. And uh, so she didn't have, you know, she's, I, I, really, I can't tell her. I can't tell her that he's died. And so I, I said, look, I'll do it. No problem. I'll go, I'll go find her and do it. Well, I haven't talked to this gal since high school, you know. And so um, I got another high school friend, actually. Um, and the two of us went and we made that death notification. It was a tough thing. Um, uh, on another occasion, um, uh, a neighbor of ours um, who had moved to, to a different part of the county, um, but our, I mean, we, they were still good, very good friends with, of the family. And uh, she passed away. She had diabetes and she, she passed away uh, very unexpectedly. Her, her uh, daughter found her after she wouldn't answer the phone, her adult daughter uh, came home, came to came to her home and, and found her and called 911 and, and I happened to be in the area. Um, and so, and I knew where her house was and I heard the address come out and I'm like, oh no. And so I rolled over there and I was uh, the first one on scene with her and that was tough. You know, because there she is on the couch, you know, as if taking a nap, but that was it. You know, she just died. And clearly it's a, it's a medical death, but it's one of those things where, you know, um, you kind of have to be not, I mean, obviously you have to be who you are to the people, right? You're, you're their friend, you're their, you know, their, uh, their people and so I I, uh, I actually on that particular one I called my wife and she came over with my daughter and was able to help uh, uh, this other daughter kind of console her and stuff and kind of get things going so um, it's some of those things you know you run into um, and uh, you know the suicides were tough they were always tough because, you know, suicide's a very, you know, um, you know, it's, I don't know how to explain, um, from an officer standpoint, you're, you're walking in and you're, you're, you're stealing yourself for the emotional onslaught that's going to happen. Um, because family members are learning that their person is gone, you know, and that comes with whatever baggage they had, you know, um, but then, um, you know, just there's that loss and, and that person that was, you know, articulate and thinking, living, breathing is now not there, irretrievably gone. And, you know, I think if anyone has experienced uh, a suicide in their life and and there's a lot of people that have, um, you know, they know what I'm talking about. That that person is now, that person that was once there is now just not there. And the guilt that comes with that, um, and, uh, as a survivor of suicide is, it's huge. And, uh, it's tough because you know you, you think you know had I been able to do something had I been a better friend had I been a better dad you know um, that wouldn't have happened and of course to the to the you know that's that's not the case obviously um, these people that, that that take their lives they 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 kind of know why they're doing it and it's it's for them that they're doing it. And, uh, and at the end of my career, um, having gone to literally hundreds of suicides, I thought I knew something about suicide. A year and a half after Year and a half after I retired, my son committed suicide. At the age of 25, he took his life. And 
that was um that's been that's been four years ago. August will be five years. Never get over it. And uh I think about it every day. And the guilt. If I'd have been a better dad. You know, I lived with that. I lived with that for a long time. I still have it, you know, to a degree. Um, but uh, that was tough, you know, and hard on the whole family, right? Um, everybody uh, kind of weathered that storm, you know, in in their own way. Um, my youngest daughter. Uh, uh, took a deep dive into addiction. Um, she was already kind of into it a little bit, but uh, she uh, she got into uh, fentanyl, heroin, everything. Um, I'm I'm happy to report that she is 19 months clean and sober, and uh, is is doing very very well and uh, is gainfully employed and is happy to be living life and has come to uh, grips with a lot of the trauma that she's endured um, and of course that that uh, catalytic event of my son's uh, suicide it was a tough thing uh, for everyone um, but you know as as an investigator you do what you can, but um, and especially in those suicide scenes, it's difficult unless you've unless you've lived it. That's one of those things that you know um, you kind of say, you know, I'm sorry for your loss, and you kind of walk away and you write the report and you move on. And and but that's what you kind of have to do. Um, you have to do that. Uh, if if you don't, and and this is kind of um, if you don't if you don't compartmentalize that stuff, you won't be able to survive. You won't be able to work. Um, you have to take the trauma of the call with whatever. Um, with whatever emotional baggage that you are besieged with from family, from onlookers, from whoever, um, uh, you have to kind of take that, swallow it, step on it. And again, as detectives, we don't get to talk about it outside the office. It's a case. It's a case that's ongoing. It's an, an ongoing investigation we're not at liberty to, to, to talk about cases um, Jamie let me let me just I just want to take a little of a side note here yeah. right so you I don't think it's overstating it where you have seen hundreds of bodies sure either it's suicide homicide you know whatever it else and I would think as a human being that has to take its toll on you yeah Right. And so you're as you're talking about compartmentalizing and really, I would imagine the only people that you are talking about that with are your partners or people that are in law enforcement and working on those cases. Right. Do you feel by going through that experience? Two questions. One is, do you think maybe and, and for lack of a better term, that maybe officers that were in your situation suffer from PTSD, whatever that way may be called, maybe I'm, the term is wrong. Mm -hmm. And does the department kind of offer anything to you? Because I just can't imagine going through seeing hundreds of bodies and it's, it's, it's like a therapist, you know, mm -hmm. you, you, what, what's your take on that? Right. Well, and you're absolutely right. Now, um, um, or, um, um, Sheriff Rainey uh, saw the things that myself and I had 
other two, um, we, we developed a crime lab and we had, uh, uh, I, I, I helped in hiring two more um, crime scene technicians. And so they all went to the same thing that I did. We kind of took turns. Um, and so they were seeing the same things that I was. And Sheriff Rainey saw that. And um, he said, you know what? It's really important that um, we be able to speak about these things to a professional. And so he offered uh, via the EAP program uh, the, um, the opportunity. Um, actually, it was, it was kind of mandatory. We had to go and visit uh, with a therapist um, at least once a year uh, for an assessment. And sometimes it was more, um, more than that. Um, I, uh, I hesitate to, to, to call what I um, took on as baggage as PTSD. Maybe it is. I don't know. Um, I know that for three years after my retirement, after I was no longer compelled to swallow that stuff and step on it and kind of keep it under so that I could continue to work the next day. Um, that stuff started coming out. I think there, um, um, uh, uh, there was one point where uh, my wife noticed that I wasn't sleeping. Why aren't you coming to bed? Why aren't you sleeping? And the answer was I didn't want to sleep. And the reason I didn't want to sleep is because the things that were intruding into my nighttime um, dreams were, I mean, I was back in those scenes, the th scenes that I'm describing. I was right back in them. Um, and it wasn't just the, uh, the scenes of looking at bodies, although it was certainly prevalent. Um, it was in the interview room, talking to, looking at people who had taken lives, looking at them um, and, and visiting with them. Um, ultimately putting handcuffs on them, but uh, there's a so, so many things that um, kind of started intruding, you know, on my sleep primarily, uh, that I didn't want to sleep, and so, um, yeah, I ended up um, just talking a little bit more about these things, um, and that helps, and uh, you know, so, but, but Sheriff Rainey uh, saw to it that we were assessed on a regular basis and that uh, we had the opportunity uh, to, to do that. Now, we have uh, also at the Sheriff's Office um, critical incident debriefings and there are staff trained to um, talk to uh, deputies that are involved in um, a particularly traumatic Thing, be it um, the death of a child or, you know, if it were a, a, it may be a mass casualty, something where children were involved. This, this, this apparatus is set up where we have trained people that will um, uh, conduct these um, critical incident debriefings um, where um, you're able to kind of talk amongst yourself and with others, it's in a kind of a group setting um, about what you saw and what you felt and that sort of thing. So that's very uh, important to note and that is uh, in the Sheriff's Office now and, and again the EAP part. So the Sheriff's Office is providing uh, those resources to our deputies, yes. And how about, we, we, we talked a little bit about this before we began the interview. How do you think, notwithstanding patrol, but certainly in major crimes and when you um, went to property crimes, how do you think being law enforcement affects your family? So interesting. I was, I was talking to my oldest daughter about this, uh, about our, our visit that we were going to have today, and, and uh, she told me um, that it's affected her in a couple of different ways. Um, and she said that, uh, um, number one, I would never marry a cop. 
And I said, why, not? why is that? And she said, well, it's not because I, I don't like the profession at all. It's just that there is no way that I would want to go through what I watched my mother go through as far as is dad coming home? You know, the, 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 the call-outs in the middle of the night, um, you know, and I was averaging at one point, I might have said it, I was, I was averaging three call-outs a week, um, and uh, it's a lot, and um, just the, she, she, she said, Dad, when, you, when we were growing up, um, if you weren't at home, you were at the station. Or you were in the field doing something, um, and and the reality is I didn't get to see my kids that much, um, and uh, and that's I guess that's my bad because um, I was kind of a money grubber, and if there were if there were collateral assignments like the BSU football games, yes, I'm gonna I'm gonna go uh, ride around on a bicycle and do security there. You bet. I'm getting paid for it, and I can watch the game. I'm doing that. Baseball games, ice hockey, you know, those things, those collateral security things that, that uh, come available, I was in on those. Why? I put braces on all my kids' teeth, you know? Um, these things are expensive, but I also had a nice home, and, and we, we, wanted, um, we wanted to provide our kids with, with um, you know, what... what I thought they needed, and so I was. I was kind of, and I and I liked it. You know, I I I, I was kind of, I was addicted kind of to the work, wearing the uniform and doing, uh, what I did. I liked it a lot. You know, we talked about the red and blue flashy lights. I liked those. <laughs> you know. So, besides the way that you deal with things and kind of the effect on it had with your family. How do you think you, and, and maybe you didn't change at all, but you saw the worst of the worst, yeah. right? Yeah. Did your views on how you see people in society change from the time that you were a fresh-faced, you know, person doing the stuff in the security in the, in the high school parking lot till when you retired? Yeah, I'm, yeah, definitely. Um, um, I, I think that probably one of the things, and it's kind of dark, uh, but one of the things that I realized for myself is that um, there are, well, I'll just say evil walks the earth. Evil, true evil. And it's easy, it's just say that, okay, it's something on TV, no. There are people who uh, are are walking among us that we don't know. We don't know who they are because they're normal folk, and they look normal. Um, but but there are some some folks that are that are truly evil people, and um, I'm I'm convinced that um, with all of the homicides that we see and deal with and investigate and charge people with, there are a number of other homicides that we know nothing about. There are people that disappear off the face of the earth and are never seen again. And um, depending on who they are, what, what status they have, maybe they're homeless, maybe they're jobless, maybe they don't have family. And if that person disappears off the face of the earth, nobody's going to ask a question or even know. And sometimes those people do disappear. And um, an interesting, an interesting thing. Um, a case that I worked, I think that fits in well here, um, was a case of a young man whose life was taken. Um, who, when uh, my first encounter was, I get a, I get a phone call from a patrol sergeant who says, Barker, uh, I'm, I'm up here in Rocky Canyon. I'm at a scene. Uh, I'm not sure what it is I'm looking at. I need you to come up here and take a peek. And so I go up there and I meet with him and we walk up into what is essentially a, a camp, 
um, has a couple of uh, chairs, a, a fire pit, and um, a deceased male laying on the ground next to the fire. And we're looking at this, and um, I see that he has head trauma, not one blow, but several. He has been hit on the head with something a number of times. And I told, I told the, the sergeant, I said, um, Sarge, this is a homicide that's occurred. This is a murder. And we need to call some other people out here to get some help. And so we did. We worked the scene. Um, and Detective Shelley Strolberg was the uh, was the lead on this case and, and did a fantastic job. Um, one of the things that we found as we were looking at this particular scene, as I'm going through and I'm snapping photographs and looking at shoe impressions and things, we're just kind of grasping at straws. There wasn't a lot here. This the scene had been cleaned up a bit uh, by whoever did this. Essentially, we had a person, a clothed person lying face down on the, on the dirt, um, and, uh, um, and not a whole lot more. And so we get it all documented, and I call, you know, we get the coroner's office out there, and now we can manipulate the body. They, they're the people that do that, and we're looking through, you know, feeling in pockets, is there anything that might identify this young man, and there wasn't. His pockets had been emptied. And so clearly there's, there's um, somebody didn't want, you know, um, this guy identified. And so we, we move on. We secure the scene, it's done, and we, and we move on. And that was a Wednesday. And so on Thursday, um, ultimately, at the coroner's office, they're able to run fingerprints. This guy did have a criminal record. He was identified. Um, and uh, his first name was Sean. And uh, so now we've got the, the information on who Sean is. And we're able to do some investigation as far as who is in his circle. Where did he work? His family. We learned that, that he had been in downtown Boise. Uh, the night before this occurred happened, this, this was on Wednesday, he was in Boise on Tuesday night, he was at the Chicago Connection Pizza in downtown Boise. And he had met there his ex-wife and his eight-year-old daughter who was celebrating her eighth birthday. Um, and so they were having that little kind of birthday get-together. Now Sean didn't live with his ex-wife. He, he had spent a few years out at ISCI at the prison. But he was out, and he wasn't on probation or parole or anything like that. He had, uh, um, and, but he was he was um, there enjoying that you know pizza with with the family, um, and then um, Sean's ex-wife said, "Yeah, he was picked up by a couple of coworkers." He said, "A couple of friends, uh, and they were going to go party somewhere." All right. Well, they separated. Away they go. Um, and uh, so we, we kind of figure out, you know, you know, what kind of the circumstance was the night before, and, and then we see this. Well, um, uh, here, here comes Saturday morning. Um, we're, we're moving along. We've disseminated what information we have to area agencies letting them know we've got this killing and that you know we're looking for any other additional information. And so that's given out in briefings and, and whatnot. And uh, Saturday morning comes along and uh, I get a phone call about, um, hey, we found some of this uh, Sean's um, um, identification and things. Uh, but we need to have you go document that, take some photos and collect it. Okay, so the location is Ann Morrison Park. Ann Morrison Park, okay, so I get there. And there I meet a young man, his name is Brian. And Brian, what Brian does is, and he's not, he's just a, a regular old citizen, a guy that's, he, he likes to collect up aluminum cans. He crushes them and that's what he makes his living on. He rides a bike around. And he knows um, 
some of the Boise police bicycle officers that uh, that work the green belt and whatnot. And uh, one of those guys, uh, Officer Schuler with uh, Boise PD, I think he's retired now. Um, but uh, Officer Schuler had befriended him and, and had told him, Brian, if you ever see anything as you're digging around in these trash cans or dumpsters or whatever, if you see anything that you think the police should know about, please call me. Here's my card. And, well, uh, Brian had a, a bunch of cards in his, in his wallet, and, uh, but he knew that Schuler would be interested. He, he called Schuler. And um, he tells, Brian tells Schuler the information on one of these cards that he found. And Schuler recognizes that as the person that he just heard about in briefing as being a decedent in the county. And so um, they, they call us and we go there. I meet Brian. I, I dig through or I see what he's got. I'm taking photographs and I see that he was inside a dumpster and uh, uh, he said, I was rooting around in this bag and this bag right here and I got something out of each. And so we grab both of those bags up and I take him down to the crime lab and we're finding all kinds of things. Um, there was um, a liquor bottle there was part of a baseball bat. There was uh, dated material. There was, you know, like newspapers and whatnot. There was uh, uh, the contents of this guy's wallet was emptied and distributed into these two bags. Um, the wallet also, and um, and so some effort had been taken by whoever collected this guy's stuff out of his pockets um, to to get rid of uh, this material. We later found out um, uh, that the, the killer, killers, um, took half of this stuff and put it in a garbage can on this end of the park. And the other half of the stuff they put in a garbage can on this end of the park. And Friday was the day that they collected up all the garbage bags. As it turns out, in this, then they dump them all in this big dumpster. And that's where Brian was. And this bag and this bag were touching in the dumpster. They came from disparate areas. And I think about um, you know, all the cases that I've worked and all the things that I've seen. And, uh, you know, I, I'm a religious guy. Um, and sometimes I have to think that there is a little bit of divine intervention that kind of takes place. I don't believe in coincidences, generally. Most detectives don't. Um, but... Here are these two bags, each containing items critical to identifying uh, items that were used in the killing. One of the things, and, and uh, Shelley Strolberg, and her, uh, she's, uh, she's a brilliant girl. Um, she, she takes, this, we see this bottle, and it's a, a unique bottle of liquor. Um, of course, in Idaho, we get our liquor from the Idaho Liquor Dispensary. We go to the liquor store. Well, on each of these bottles is a little sticker, and on the sticker, this has a number, and that number identifies which liquor store this stuff was procured at. And we figure out that this was the uh, liquor store that used to be right there in Americana and Shoreline. I don't know if it's still there or not, but um, that's where this stuff was was gotten. And it was it's not like a regular bottle of liquor. It was unique. And so... Um, Detectives go in there and they say, hey, do you have video? Of course they have video uh, of when this particular bottle of this particular product was sold. They don't sell a lot of it. And so it readily came up, yeah. And here was video of two females who are later identified as co-workers of this man, of Sean. Um, and uh, we were able to um, figure out after some interview uh, with one of the individuals that was ultimately arrested um, where they got the bat and the bat was picked up at a uh, 
Idaho Youth Ranch store. I think they paid a quarter for it. Um, and so then there's video of that as well. Um, and so we were able to put this together um, within a week of finding this man down up in Rocky Canyon. We were able to get this all put together. We had these two people in custody uh, before the following Wednesday when we discovered them. And um, they confessed to all. Um, and uh, they're still living in prison. Um, but uh, one, of the, one of the questions that was asked um, of the primary aggressor in this thing was, why did you do this? And why did you select him? And the answer given was, uh, I wanted to know what it felt like to kill somebody, and nobody missed this guy. He's a nobody. And so, right? So there. I mean, that's an interesting. I mean, that that case was interesting. Um, and that little bit of with with Brian. Yeah, we bought him a new bike. You bet we did. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, had it. Let me think about the whole the whole thing. This could have. This could have absolutely been an, another case that we wouldn't have figured it out. Had it not been for the efforts of this kid who was digging in a dumpster and had the, the wherewithal to call his friend Schuster. Hmm. Pretty interesting. I thought it was an interesting story. It's one of those that um, um, I tell around the campfire sometimes. You know, it's it's a good story. Jamie, just one last question for you. Yeah. People are watching and listening to this. What, what, what would you want? What would you want normal people that don't know anything about law enforcement to know? Um, gosh. You know, given the climate in the country right now, with how law enforcement is being used. Um, it's difficult to get um, people who want to do what I did for 30 years. Um, that's a shame. I, uh, I, I wish that that were not so. Um, uh, likewise, I wish that every law enforcement officer had um, the the positive experiences that I had in law enforcement, um, for all of the for all of the bad stuff that I that I took in, and for all of the you know, therapists will call it trauma, right? <laughs> um, for all of that that I that I took in, um, there was so much good stuff uh, as well um, when we, when we could help somebody. Um, when we could, um, you know, I don't know, bring bring some light, some joy to uh, other people in the community. That um, I wish that there were more agencies that could do that. I think as well as the Ada County Sheriff's Office does. I think they do a very very good job at that. Um, I wish there was more of that. There needs to be more of that. Um, and uh, you know, um, I just, I think that, uh, you know, we, we do, we do the best we can, you know, and there's a lot of officers out there who are working very hard, they're very smart, very diligent, um, very committed and dedicated to the things that, uh, they are doing and they want to do it right. And, uh, um, Unfortunately, there's a lot of a lot of voices that would, you know, cast a lot of self doubt on those officers, and self doubt is dangerous. There's one thing that um, I, you know, that I always, I always, even though I'm a retired cop and I do a security gig, yes, but there's there's one thing that I learned early on and it's I find myself I catch myself doing it all the time and that is uh, those three words 
watch their hands, right? Um, I do that constantly. And, um, and my kids have told me, you know, Dad, whenever we, whenever we go on a river rafting trip that you object to, or we, we do something dangerous, we always hear in the back of our heads your voice telling us not to do something stupid, you know. And, uh, you know, I guess, I guess if I'm, if I'm uh, uh, leaving a legacy for my kids and that, I guess that's probably a decent one. Don't do dumb things, <laughs> right? Um, and if, you know, love your neighbor and help, you know, that's, that's what you need to do. And I think that's what a lot of officers try to do, you know. And if, and if they're not, they should. Jamie, I can't thank you enough. Thank you. Absolutely.